Hi everybody, this is Julian from AWS and welcome to episode 2 of my podcast. It's a bit of a special episode today. I'm going to focus on TensorFlow 2.0 and how to run it on AWS. And the reason why I'm doing this is because uh, TensorFlow 2.0 is now available on all compute platforms. So you can easily run it on EC2, Container Services, and SageMaker. So it's a good opportunity to cover all bases. First, I'm going to uh, give you a little bit of background information on TensorFlow. Then I will explain how TensorFlow 2.0 is really a step forward and how it's different from uh, TensorFlow 1.0, 1x, I guess. And uh, then I'll show you how to get started with uh, TensorFlow 2.0 on EC2 containers and SageMaker. Let's get to work. As you probably know, TensorFlow is an open source library for machine learning and deep learning. The main API is in Python, and you have some uh, additional support for languages like Java, for example. Uh, it came out uh, a little more than four years ago, and uh, the first version called uh, TensorFlow 1x has been extremely successful. Uh, I recently read a research report from uh, an analyst company called Nucleus, and, uh, and they're telling us that uh, TensorFlow is used in 74% of deep learning research projects with PyTorch uh, a distant second at 43%. So TensorFlow is really the number one library out there. Of course, over time, a lot of features have been added to TensorFlow and uh, TensorFlow 2.0 came out at the end of September. So how is that different from TensorFlow 1X? I think it's time for the whiteboard. TensorFlow 1X uses a programming model called symbolic mode. Okay, let me explain. Whiteboard, please. Here we go. So let's say we're trying to compute A multiplied by B plus C. Okay, and of course, please bear in mind, these are not uh, integers or floating points, right? These are matrices, because when you're working with machine learning or deep learning, you're working with matrices, okay? Multi-array, multi-dimensional arrays, and they're, the fancy word for those is, you guessed it, tensors, okay? That's why this library is called TensorFlow. Anyway, Let's not get bogged down in vocabulary. So when you're working with uh, uh, symbolic programming, you first define the execution graph. Okay, so we would need two variables, A and B. We would need a multiplication operator. Okay, variables, operators. And we would need a third variable, C, and we would need uh, the an addition a plus operator okay and we would combine them in a graph just like this okay so a and b feed them into the multiplication operator and then feed the result of that and c to the plus operator and that would give us our our result okay so if we were writing symbolic code it will look something like this we would define three name variables Okay, A, B, C, storing no data at this point, okay, just being variables, uh, so names really for uh, data that we'll provide later on. And then we would define um, a new variable D, which would be the multiplication of A and B. Again, at this point, this is just definition. This is, again, symbolic programming. No actual processing is, uh, is performed. Then E would be uh, D plus C, okay? And that would build the execution graph you see over there, right? And once the graph is fully defined, we would compile it using uh, um, a library function. And this would give us a proper function, let's call it F, that we could then apply to actual values for A, B, and C. So we would invoke F passing values for A, B, C, and that would give us our result. Okay, let's call it Y. So we can clearly see here, um, 
why this uh, programming model is called define then run. Okay, first we define the graph and then uh, we run um, the graph using data that we provided. And you could say, yeah, wh what's the, you know, what's the problem with this? Well, the problem with this is as you compile the graph, it's transformed into an internal representation, something that's really highly optimized, uh, optimized for speed, optimized for memory consumption, and it looks probably nothing like your initial graph anymore. So that makes it really, really difficult to debug and inspect the code and understand why uh, that code is, uh, is uh, not working the way you want it to run. Right, and I guess this contributes to the the black box problem um, around deep learning. Okay, so for example, if we look at this graph again, okay, uh, we could see that actually D is pretty is pretty useless, right? I mean, sure, we need D to store the result, but that's the only thing it does. And then we use D on the next line for E. So you could say, well, maybe the memory that we allocate for D can be reused by E, right? There's no reason to uh, to have memory allocated for D and E. So a memory optimization would be, okay, let's reuse D, uh, the memory allocated for D for the E tensor and, and save memory, okay? This is just a very, very basic example, but this is the kind of stuff that graph compilation would do, okay? And, and the result, I guess the benefit is, um, you know, you end up using less memory and of course, you run the graph faster, so you train faster, okay? So that's symbolic programming, fast, efficient, difficult to debug, difficult to understand. Okay, that was TensorFlow 1x. Now, let's talk about TensorFlow 2.0 and imperative mode. The main difference between TensorFlow 2.0 and TensorFlow 1x is that we can now shift from symbolic mode to imperative mode, okay? And TensorFlow actually calls it eager mode. So let's see what this does. Whiteboard, please. So let's look at the same calculation here, okay? Uh, and the good news is you already know what imperative mode is because imperative mode is just running code and writing code the way we've been running it forever, I suppose. So writing a line of code at a time and running a line of code at a time. So this is called defined by run, okay? There's no two stages here. Uh, we just run that code and it builds and uh, runs the graph. Uh, line by line. So here I'm using NumPy as an example, but it could be Java, it could be C++. Again, imperative mode is what you already know. Okay, so if we were using NumPy, we would create three variables, A, B, C, uh, three NumPy arrays with actual data. Okay, so data would be provided right there. And then uh, we would create uh, uh, additional NumPy arrays one for multiplication, so D is A multiplied by B, and E is D plus C, and of course, we get our result. Now, if we try to look at what's happening, you know, it's really running line by line, so every time we run a line, uh, we create a new NumPy object, and all of them exist, okay, they all exist in memory, so uh, A, B, C, D, E are all um, um, inspectable, and uh, this makes the code, e I guess, easier to understand, easier to debug. You know exactly what each line does. There is nothing happening magically. Uh, and what you see is what you run and what you debug, right? And that's the main difference. So easier to understand, a more natural way of writing code, a more um, friendly way of writing code. Now, of course, the downside to this is um, it's slower because we, we have fewer opportunities or possibly no opportunities to actually optimize and do all the crazy stuff that, uh, that we can do on graphs. So that's eager mode or uh, as, as TensorFlow calls it. Now, the good news is you actually get uh, symbolic mode as well, okay? Uh, you can start by writing your code 
uh, in the imperative fashion, which is great for experimentation, debugging, etc., etc. And then you can easily um, transform it, compile it to uh, to the symbolic form, and get the increased speed and uh, and optimization that goes with it. Okay. All right. So you don't get to pick. Uh, you can have your cake and eat it, or as we say in France, uh, you can have cheese and dessert, right? Which is nice. So that's the biggest difference with TensorFlow 2.0. The other one that I want to mention is that the, the Keras API, which used to be uh, a separate library uh, running on top of TensorFlow, is now fully integrated with TensorFlow. And I guess it's now the preferred API. And you can, uh, you can use Keras uh, at a very high level or you can also customize it heavily and uh, I guess more than you could in the past. So here too, you know, you get um, uh, more opportunities to experiment quickly as well as to optimize and write custom code, custom training loops, custom layers, etc. So all those two things, uh, eager mode and full Keras integration are really, really cool features. Okay, so now let's look at how you can run TensorFlow to zero on AWS. The analyst report that I mentioned earlier also uh, told us that 85% of cloud-based TensorFlow workloads run on AWS. And, you know, that's a nice number. So I guess it gives us a responsibility to make sure TensorFlow runs nicely on AWS. So let's, uh, let's take a look at the different ways you can do that. Um, the first one is to run it on an EC2 instance. And to make it simple, um, we've built those deep learning AMIs. If you've never heard about AMIs, that means Amazon Machine Image. And it's basically the binary file that is used to create virtual machines on Amazon EC2. Okay, and yes, it's pronounced AMIs and not AMIs, right? Don't get me started. Anyway, if you go to AWS Marketplace, you'll find uh, different AMIs already packaged. So the one you want to uh, use if you want to use TensorFlow to zero is version 26 or later. Okay, at the time of recording, this is the latest version but uh, don't go and pick something older because you're going to miss uh, TensorFlow 2.0. Okay, and these are available for Amazon Linux 2 or Ubuntu 18. So whatever, uh, whatever suits you, okay? Uh, so you can just select this AMI, launch an instance, okay? You don't need me to show you this. Launch an instance, which I've already done. I've launched uh, a G4 instance here. So I can SSH to my instance and I can see the different environments that are available there. This is all managed by Conda, the, the package manager for Python. And let's uh, select TensorFlow to Python 3.6, activate that. Okay, and now if I run Python 3 and if I import TensorFlow, whoops, and I look at the version. All right, it is TensorFlow 2.0. Okay, and you know what to do next. So this is one way of doing it. Just fire up um, the deep learning AMI, the latest version, and it comes with TensorFlow 2.0 pre-installed. And of course, we update those AMIs very regularly, so you will also get the, the future versions. Okay, so another way you can use TensorFlow 2.0 is uh, with the deep learning containers. So the deep learning containers are what you would think, AWS maintain containers that package the deep learning libraries that are uh, available on the deep learning MI. Okay, so uh, we have uh, MXNet versions and PyTorch versions and TensorFlow versions, and we have separate containers for training and prediction. So for the sake of simplicity, I'm going to keep working on, uh, on this same instance, but of course, this would work exactly the same um, on, uh, on one of our container services, ECS, EKS, or just any EC2 instance pre-installed with Docker, okay? So the first step is to log in to Amazon ECR. 
the uh, Docker registry service for AWS. Okay, so all uh, images are stored in this AWS account. Make sure you provide the right region for that. Okay, and uh, next you can just pull the image. Okay, and you'll find the list of image names in the deep learning container documentation. Okay, I already did that because uh, you know it's not really interesting to see Docker images being uh, being pulled. Okay, so now my image is available, and I can easily run it just like that. Docker run. Okay, and uh, and again, if I run Python, and if I import TensorFlow, I should see that this is the proper version. Okay. Yes, version two zero. So you know nothing fancy, just containers. But uh, you know, unless you really, really enjoy maintaining your own containers, you know, why not? But uh, you know, give those a try. They might just <laughs> save you some time. And of course, these come with uh, optimized versions. Um, we have actually a, a dedicated team working on uh, optimizing TensorFlow on, on AWS. So this is not a vanilla version that you're getting here. This is actually a, a pretty fast version. So how do you use TensorFlow 2.0 on SageMaker? Well, just like you used the previous versions, nothing to learn. Okay, uh, and um, this is a very simple notebook with a simple uh, TensorFlow 2.0 script, which I will put on GitLab, and of course you will, you'll get all the information for that. Um, and how do you use that thing? Well, remember that when you're training a TensorFlow script on SageMaker, you use this uh, SageMaker.TensorFlow.TensorFlow estimator, okay? And um, basically this takes your script as a first parameter, your infrastructure requirements, so how many instances you want, uh, what type of instance do you want, hyperparameters, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and the framework version. Okay, so there's a parameter that's actually called framework version, where you say, hey, I want to use TensorFlow 115 or I want to use something else. And now, uh, as of yesterday, actually, uh, according to the GitHub repository for the SageMaker SDK, you can now say, hey, give me framework version 2.0.0. And that's it, right? So in case you're wondering, you need SageMaker SDK 1.49. Okay, so make sure you update your SDK to this latest version. This was pushed yesterday. Uh, but if you have 149 or later, you can now just say, all right, please give me framework version 200. And that's it. Okay, nothing fancy. And uh, for the record, this hasn't <laughs> officially been announced. I'm not sure why. But hey, the code is out there. So the feature is available for all of you. Okay. And then deploying is exactly the same as well. Okay, you would call dot deploy on uh, your estimator and get a model and you'll be able to predict, okay? So from a SageMaker perspective, the only difference is use the new framework version, okay? Uh, well, I think that's it. I think that's uh, what I wanted to, uh, to show you today. So remember three ways you can use TensorFlow 2.0, deep learning AMI, uh, make sure you use version 26 and up deep learning containers, and SageMaker, and make sure you use SDK 1.49 and up. Well, that's it for this episode. I hope you learned a few things, and Merry Christmas, and Happy Holidays to all of you out there, and I'll see you soon. Maybe I'll have a, a New Year's episode, who knows? You know, anything's possible. It's AWS, it's machine learning, it's totally crazy. See you next time, and until then, keep rocking. Yeah.